All right, so today we're going to talk about the single most effective way to completely destroy the narcissist's psychic hold over you. All right, so that's what this is, you being free of the hold that somebody has over you to keep you in a toxic relationship that isn't working for you. All right, so if you're new to my channel, uh, you can go and click the join button here. At the super empath level and above, you get access to private videos where I teach you exactly what I did to do what I'm going to describe today. I'm going to describe it in a way I haven't described before, um, but is the thing that gives you the most power. Uh, let's see, my stream says it's not doing so good. So let's see here. Not receiving enough video. Why is that? I don't know. So uh, let's see. Anything else I can do to improve this? I think it's just, it's got its own stupid, ridiculous thing. All right. So we seem to be doing okay. Anyway. Uh, click the join button if you want to learn how to do what I'm going to describe today, which will give you the ability to destroy the psychic hold that the narcissist or the borderline has over you if you're trying to escape a toxic relationship. This channel is devoted to people who have been in toxic relationships, romantic relationships with people of cluster B personality disorder types like borderline personality disorder or narcissistic personality disorder. And I am not a psychologist. I'm not here to psychoanalyze you, nor am I here to talk about the mental disease of BDP or NPD from a, um, a detached perspective. I'm here to share with those of you who are not, who do not have cluster B personality disorders, what it's like so that you have a place where somebody understands but coming from a place of having achieved freedom from that relationship all right so uh and before i forget uh, i have decided to do coaching i'm not a psychologist so i'm not here to counsel you if you need psychological counseling please find a qualified professional but i am happy to do some coaching freedom.thunderwizard.com and I might be able to help you at least get some understanding so you can take some steps in the proper direction. I find that that's one of the biggest problems is people don't know what to do and or they're afraid to do anything and or that, you know, you've just been gaslit so much that you've gotten trained to just get stuck and not be able to do anything about it. So that's really kind of what I do here is I just help maybe unplug some things so that you can take some action and find some healing. All right, so let's get back to the subject here, which is narcissistic kryptonite, how to escape the narcissist. So when I say escape the narcissist, um, I'm talking about the hold that they have over you mentally, emotionally, psychologically. Maybe it feels spiritual. Maybe you feel like they, they own you. You are experiencing what's called cognitive dissonance, which is a really fancy way of saying you feel like you're going crazy because you know this is bad for you, but you can't let go of the unreasonable hope that it's going to get better. Even though you've been in it for months, years, decades, even though there's so much overwhelming proof, forget about evidence, there's proof that it's never going to get better. It's only going to get worse. If you look at it, it looks like it's getting better. It always ends up getting worse. Never does it truly ever get better. The graph is like this and it keeps going down, down and down. But even though you see that, even though you feel that, even though everybody around you tells you, even though your life and your body and your emotions are telling you, there's this cognitive dissonance that says, no, I'm almost there. I'm almost there. If I can just this next time, if I can figure out exactly what to do, if I can just say the right thing, do the right thing, avoid saying the right thing, avoid doing the wrong thing, 
it's about to happen. We're making progress. This last time we almost had it, but it screwed up. Either she didn't feel your love or you said the wrong thing or you know, it's always that hope. It's always about to happen. But if you're honest, it never has ever worked. The periods that it felt good were always followed every single time by a worse crash. Never has it got, gotten better and then continue to get better. It always gets better and then worse and then better and then worse and better and worse. How do you escape the cognitive dissonance, the part of your mind? Well, this is called mortification of the narcissist. So mortification, uh, narcissistic mortification is when, and by the way, I'm talking about borderlines too. The latest psychological understanding in the professional psychological world is that borderlines are in fact narcissists, that borderline personality disorder is in fact a type of narcissistic personality disorder. So for those of you who leave comments, continue to leave comments. Again, you know, you're seeing some of the earlier videos and you have your own experience. People continue to leave comments wanting to make a differentiation between the narcissist and the borderline. Or you have this experience and, and afterwards you want to then come to the realization and say, I think my borderline was also comorbid narcissist. Um, you're repeating yourself. There, is, there isn't a difference. There's a difference in expression, but the core issue is still the same. Uh, that's, if, you can, if you can get that, if you can absorb that borderline personality disorder is vulnerable narcissistic personality disorder. Uh, um, inverted, no, that's really not really the borderline. Um, what's other words that people use? Uh, you know, words like that, you know, that, that the vulnerable, the collapsed narcissist, um, covert narcissism. If you can accept that borderline personality disorder is a form of narcissistic personality disorder, you will be better equipped to realize it's not going to work. Because this is part of the delusion that you have. The delusion is, if you were the borderline, is that, well, borderlines have empathy. And she actually does love me. And she really does want it to work. She just has this really horrible thing because she's been through so much pain and trauma that when she's afraid she just uh, destroys everything and she doesn't mean to do it if i can just find a way to get her to understand and trust me but if you can accept that that's the delusion that's the that's the that is the uh, strategy of the illness the mental illness you have to treat it as though it has a strategy and the mental illness is, has a strategy that it is performing on both you and the borderline. The borderline is just, and this is true with the narcissist as well. The borderline and the narcissist are just as much a victim of their mental illness as you are. Now, if you can get out of your own codependent narcissism and stop projecting your mindset onto them, then you won't have to make the decision of, do they really love me and they're just in a lot of pain or are they evil geniuses trying to destroy me? Because if you're in that, trying to, trying to navigate that minefield, it means you haven't accepted the fact that they have a mental illness that prevents them from being able to allow uh, you to love them and for them to love you back. So, if I beat that horse to death enough, narcissistic personality disorder is also borderline personality disorder. They are the same thing, different expression of the same issue. So how to get, to get rid of the borderline's magical grasp over your brain uh, is narcissistic mortification. So this is a term which, mortification, in case you don't know what it means, is a Latin word, it means to make dead. Mort is dead. Facio, uh, uh, facere, means to make. Mortification means to dead make, to make dead. 
uh, to incapacitate, to um, yeah, make them without any power. So narcissistic mortification is the thing that the narcissist is trying to avoid. Here we have Superman. Superman is a perfect uh, uh, understanding of this. You can tell that he is in the presence of kryptonite, which is the only thing in the universe that destroys him. And so we see actually Superman is in fact a borderline or a narcissist. Those of you who uh, call yourself super empaths, guess what you're trying to model yourself after? This guy. Those of you who want to go supernova, you are telling us that you either are or you fantasize about becoming a narcissist. Uh, because this is narcissism. So Superman, he was born on the planet Kryptonite. Kryptonite where his family of origin, his mother, his father, his uncle, his sister, his brother, his society. And that society destroyed itself out of its own narcissistic mortification, self-mortification, self-destruction. So that planet exploded before that happened, which would have meant the death of Kal-El, baby Kal-El, who became Superman. Before that happened, Kal-El was discarded. He was discarded by his own family. They put him in a spaceship by himself as an infant and then shot him off into the cold emptiness of space. That is exactly what happens to the narcissist and the borderline. As infants, they are, uh, they, they are neglected, abandoned, rejected, devalued at a time when they do not have the ability to protect themselves. As I've said to you before, it has been proven the fastest way to kill an infant is to never pick it up, never touch it. You can feed it, you can wipe its butt, you can keep it warm, but if you do not pick the baby up and hold it and cuddle it and look at it and talk to it and play with it and interact with it, if you do not do that, the infant will die. Borderlines and narcissists are those infants who almost died. They got just enough interaction to keep them from dying, but they might as well be because there's nobody home. They are broken. There's no individual there. And so they live this mortification. There's, there's no sense of self. There's no identity. There's no feeling of self-love, self-awareness, self-empowerment. It's not like you and I who are struggling with it and we have challenges with it and we have all kinds of other issues, but we have this thing called object constancy. We have this thing called we know uh, how time elapses. We don't have, we don't dissociate, at least not to the level of the borderline or the narcissist. The borderline and the narcissist, when they try or are forced to experience their true internal self, it is so horrific and it does at the very least feel like it's killing them. It is so horrific that they dissociate. They had to do that as infants in order to survive during being left alone for days or hours or you know, who knows what happened. In order to survive, they had to dissociate from the pain. So that's how they function now. And that is their mortification, is to be remembered. So what happens to Superman, being the good borderline narcissist that he is, when he is faced with what? Kryptonite. Kryptonite is a piece of the destructed planet from which he is derived. Whenever somebody brings this piece of his origins, 
to him where he must look at it and experience it, it literally starts to destroy him. If he stays near the kryptonite, he will turn into a goo of green mess. This is how to get rid of them internally. You have to internally mortify the narcissist, the borderline in your brain. So if you are in a relationship or if you were in a relationship with a borderline or a narcissist and it lasted longer, then I'm just, and I'm being kind here. If it lasted longer than the first devaluation or split, by definition, you are codependent. Before you start to say, I'm not dependent on anybody, I, I, Rajabita, then you don't understand what the word codependent means. Every time that you talk about how the borderline this, or the narcissist that, or they can't do this, and I need to do that for them, and they promised me this, and then they did that, and you don't understand, they stole from me, and they lied to me, and they hurt me in all these ways, Whenever you go into that, you launch into that explanation, you are in essence saying, I am a codependent. Because a codependent relationship is a dynamic where one person must take on the shortcomings, the dysfunction of the other person in order for the relationship to work. Because if you didn't do that, all the stuff you're complaining about. They did this to me and they promised this and I did that for them and I held her hair over the toilet every other day and I forgave her. If you didn't have all of that narrative telling me and everybody else and yourself how horrible they are, and I know that they were, you wouldn't be codependent because you would have met the person. This is again assuming that they would have even wanted you because a borderline and a narcissist has a radar. They can tell if you're a broken codependent. They can tell. Maybe con not consciously, but they're attracted to you. You're attracted to them. If you didn't have that, the moment they showed up, you would go, ah, there's something not right about this person. They love me too much, too fast. I am freaked out. Or, you know, the moment that they turned on you and snapped on you, you'd go, wow, something's not right with you. I am out of here. You didn't do that. So by definition, you are codependent. So um, I forgot where I was going with that. But um, being that you are codependent, the borderline, the narcissist honed in on you, you know, and, and remember this, because this is unusual, especially if you're a man. If we're talking about borderline women, this is especially true. Borderline women, when they chase after you, they seemingly have no fear. They have no problem if they've never met you. I mean, I get this all the time because I'm an online personality and borderlines, you know, can see it in me and, and they'll email me. They'll call me on the phone. It's, I swear to God, this happened. I don't know how she got my number, but some woman called me on the phone and started telling me how, you know, ghosts were chasing after her and, and, and I can help. And, you know, like, how the hell did you get my number? Um, so with all the fear of uh, rejection and abandonment that they have, in the beginning, they have no problem chasing you down, tackling you to the ground. And it's great for your ego if you're a guy, especially if you're an older guy and they're younger than you. Of course, of course they're going to have daddy issues if they're borderlines. And for them to chase after you seemingly fearless without any, you know, I want to be with you. You're my perfect this and you're the that. And I've always wanted a guy that's 20 years older than me and uh, bald and 10 pounds overweight and really muscular. That's what I've been looking for my whole life. Well, that's red flag number one. And you thought that was great because you're codependent. So because you're codependent, what ends up happening immediately? It happens, I don't care how long you're... Uh, your love bombing phase lasted, how long the idealization phase lasted. What happens immediately is they want to get in your head. They want to get in your head because they want the ultimate goal now of their illness, their mental illness. They're not consciously doing this. Their conscious motivation, listen to me, codependence, the conscious motivation of 
the borderline and probably many of the narcissists as well, the conscious motivation is to have you save them, to finally be the one person that will love them, that will see them on the deepest level and whom they can uh, express all of these intense loving feelings that they have. They honestly want that. But the, uh, the mental illness within them, the narcissistic personality disorder within them, which is manipulating them. It's a defense mechanism that is completely off the rails. It is a defense mechanism and an impulse that has completely gone nuclear. It is on steroids. It is the Hulk is the perfect example of the borderline. You know, again, these these comic book characters, doctors, what's his name? <laughs> Forget his name. Doctor, uh, whatever the hell his name is, you know, the, the somebody Bannon, right? Doctor Bannon, he's the he's this nonviolent, you know, very <laughs> reasonable scientist guy. And then all you had to do was make him mad. You make him a little bit mad and he doesn't get angry. He turns into the Hulk. Yeah, just borderline narcissism. It's all the same stuff. Um, but what happens immediately is that they want the same thing that you want, which is why you guys connect so well. But the, uh, the motivation, uh, the strategy of their mental illness is to get inside of you. And when they get inside of you, what they plan on doing is get deep enough into your psyche so that they can play musical chairs. They're going to take their internal mortification that they are constantly running from. Superman doesn't realize it, but he is constantly running away from kryptonite. He can't even uh, get away from it here on planet Earth. Planet Earth, there's kryptonite everywhere. He just doesn't know where it is. He has to be careful. It could, he could step on it at any point by accident. So the internal part of the borderline that is this black hole of empty pain that can never be filled by anything or anyone. They want to play musical chairs with you. The, the, the mental illness, the defense mechanism on steroids has it planned out. It lies to the borderline and says, no, what's happening is that we're getting close to them. And you, this time you're going to love them. This time you won't leave. This time you won't dissociate. This time you won't do any of those things. You are going to love them because you've known them for a whole three hours now and they're perfect. This is it. It's all over. We can relax now. Let's get deep in there. Let's, let's, get, let's love them and let them see us and love us. And while that happens, the secondary psychopath, their defense mechanism, their mental illness is trying to get as deep into you as possible so that they can play musical chairs. And the idea is that the mental illness is going to take your sense of self and bring that into them and bring their lack of sense of self, their emptiness and self-hatred and deposit that in you. When they can make the change, you know, like the movie Face Off, right? When they can make that switch, the moment they can do that, they'll be out of there. Pew. This is what the mental illness does. The mental illness tells the borderline, no, you love this person. This person is the best and you might really be the best. I really was the best person for my borderline ex. I, I'm absolutely certain of it had things gone the way I thought I wanted. In all reality, it would have been the best thing. She would have been the happiest person in the world if she could have accepted it. Uh, but that wasn't the strategy of her mental illness. So um, and I forgot where I was going here. Anyway. So you get where I'm going here. So the moment that they're able to do the face off, do the, do the switch, do the handoff, boom, they're out of there. The mental illness tells them, no, 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 you're getting close to them. No, you're getting close. You're falling in love. And then they hit pay dirt. The mental illness hits pay dirt. It gets to your psychic core. And then it says, this person's out to kill you says to the to the borderline this person is trying to kill you they're lying to you they're a narcissist they're an evil genius and then they come up with whatever justification or excuse or 
they go running out the door to find somebody else. And that's when you when they disappear on you, when you know you had the best love making of your life and you were planning out your um, your future. And then the next morning you wake up and not only are they not there and there's no note, they're just gone. And you find out a week later or a month later that they got up in the middle of the night and went to a bar and met somebody and traveled to Bermuda with that person. That's why. It's because they got in there. They got in there and they made the handoff. So what you end up feeling is what they feel. You end up consciously feeling what they feel unconsciously, which is this all the time, 24 seven. This is going on inside of them all the time. You will never be able to. There's no person in the world that can protect uh, that can protect Superman from kryptonite. Nobody can protect Superman from kryptonite, not even Lois Lane. Lois Lane can't protect him. You can't protect the borderline from their own kryptonite within them. So um, what, what you have to do is to mortify the narcissist inside of you. So they put inside of you a, a version of themselves. So they put a voice in you, a feeling. You didn't have that before you met them. Unless you, you know, were really, you know, and, and, you know, unless something I'm not aware of really horrible happened to you. Before you met the borderline, you had your codependence. You had your untapped codependent potential that was just waiting to come out. And the borderline was kind enough to grab it and to bring you to your full potential. And, but you didn't have fully activated within you the internal borderline, the internal narcissist, the internal psychopath. So what they do is they get inside of you and with all the little devaluations, even during the love bombing phase, if you're honest, during the love bombing phase, you were paranoid, you were stepping on eggshells. Even though they were looking at you and loving you and there was a smile on their face, there was something inside of you that was afraid at any moment the, the dream was going to come crashing down. And they'd throw out little hints. You know, little things like, uh, I remember once with my borderline ex, my knee was bothering me and she was laying on the bed and we were looking at each other and laughing and I went and I put one knee on the bed and my knee hurt and I went, ah, like that. And she goes, ah, grandpa. I mean, it was a dig and it hurt. She did it with a smile on her face, but it was a devaluation. The devaluation is there. They always have to let you know, no, I'm love bombing you, but this could self-destruct at any moment if you don't give me what I need. Now, you're not conscious of that. You don't want to see that. You may want to tell me that, no, for five years she was perfect. I know that's not true. I know for a fact it's not true. I know that you were feeling anxious and afraid even while you were being love bombed. How do I know that? Because I was with a borderline and I know exactly what it's like, that there's never any solid ground. The message that they're giving you when they're love bombing you is very simple. The message is, I don't have any love inside of myself. I see you as my mother or my father or my dad or both. And I want you to make me feel good. And as long as you make me feel good, I'm going to be a happy little baby. But the moment that you stop making me feel good, I am going to scream cry like you've never heard. My borderline ex said to me when we first met, she said, I'm looking for a strong, confident, masculine presence. And I want to make him happy so that he will be happy. And then when he is happy, I can just slip inside of his happiness and soak it up. And I had no idea what the hell that meant. It sounded great. It sounded like she was going to spend the rest of her life making me happy. That's not what she was saying. What she was saying was, 
Listen, you have to be happy and confident and strong all the time and I have to feel it and I have to feel good and safe in it so that I can feed off of it because I don't have any of that inside of me. And if you don't make me feel that way, this isn't going to work and I'm going to stop being there for you and I'm going to stop loving you, which is exactly what happened. We went on our first trip together. Uh, over the weekend and in the car on the way she started talking about how she was uncomfortable and she was saying um, I can tell you're not in a in a happy place you feel negative to me so I couldn't have I couldn't just be tired I couldn't just be hungry I couldn't be anything because if I had any negative feelings even if I was acting perfectly fine and normal if she could sense or project onto me some kind of unhappiness that meant to her that she wasn't getting her fix from me and or that I was going to leave her and you know and then it was it was the trip from hell from hell it was just pure torture from then on out so uh they get inside of you with this when they're love bombing you and they install inside of you a little psychopath who's constantly judging you for what you're saying, what you're doing, what you're feeling. Even like to this day, I still have to remind myself it's okay to listen to my own music. You know, there was just something about my music. You know, she had her music, which I, I told her, I said, I don't get it. I mean, if you can listen to it, that's fine. It's not my thing. But if I tried to play my music, oh, my God, can we not listen to that? That's so, oh, I can't. Oh, that's horrible. And you're so stupid for listening to that. God, you're such an old fart. I don't get that. What is with that guitar music? And I felt like shame for enjoying my music. I still to this day, you know, a year, a year and a half later almost, I still, when I play my music, I have to go, it's okay that I like that music and it's okay that other people might not. That's good music. It's okay. So they get in there and they install the little psychopath critic who's going to constantly keep you feeling crazy. Like there's always something wrong with you that, that no matter who you are, no matter what you do, it's never good enough. And that creates an anxiety within you because you codependent, your mother, your father, at some point gave you the feeling that your worth was based on what you do, that you just being alive is not enough. Your existence is not a valid existence. You have to do something for somebody somewhere in order to be worthy to be alive. And so the little borderline in your codependent brain is telling you, that whatever it is that you're doing isn't good enough, it's stupid, I'm not going to like that. And so you start thinking all the time, um, is that, would she like that or not like that? I should listen to different music, or uh, uh, I'll listen to that in secret, or I'll wear this, or I'll do that, or maybe I'll grow my beard, or maybe I'll shave my beard, or maybe I'll shave my head, or maybe I'll grow my hair, or maybe I'll gain some weight or lose some weight or something, because at some point you know there's going to be some detail about you, either something you did do or didn't do or did say or didn't say or did think or didn't think. It's going to be something at any point in time that can make them take off, make them split on you. And that is by design. They're not consciously doing it. Their mental illness is doing it. Because it's a process, it's a download. The mental illness is trying to download itself onto you so that then they can take your sense of self. And the mental illness thinks it's going to work this time. This time with this person, I'm finally going to be able to balance it. I'll take their identity, I'll give them my empty black hole of an identity, and it'll work this time. And it doesn't, of course, but the download is successful. There's just enough discomfort. There's just enough lack of self-love. There's just enough codependence, which means there's just enough 
of a belief inside of you that your worth comes from what you do for others. Those of you super empaths out there, I swear to God, I'm not lying to you. I went onto YouTube and some person said, and I quote, being a super empath means that we are the answer to people's prayers. We are here to fix the pain of the world. They honestly believe that. And he was saying it with heaviness in his face. And he said it with this sort of victim mentality. I'm carrying my cross and I'm here. My job is to bring healing to the world. That is your narcissism. But you have that. And that's why you chased after the borderline. Because their unsolvable problems are so intense that you, like Superman, were going to take on their pain and love them till they could love themselves. But what happened was is that you took on their self-mortification. So the, the codependent consciously feels the self-mortification. So I haven't even told you what mortification is. Mortification means that the borderline sees their true self. They're mirrored and they see there's nobody home. They see that it's empty and that there's no love and there's no self. There's no value. There's no bright shining soul in there full of love. They see that it's empty. They see their narcissism. This is what vampires are about. This is why vampires don't have a reflection in the mirror. Vampires are what? They are a projection. They are a false personality. They are a facade. That's why they can shapeshift. They can become wolves or bats because they're no, there's nobody home. That's why they feed off of the blood of others. But the worst thing you can do is put a mirror up in front of them. And they will run. They can't tolerate seeing that there's nobody home. That's mortification. When you have a narcissist who believes that they are the best thing since life spread and I'm the best at this and I do that and I'm perfect at this and I never have any problems and you go, no, actually yesterday you crashed the car. You had no idea how to uh, even cook an egg and you're supposed to be a master chef. You aren't a millionaire like you keep telling people you are. You're actually $20,000 in debt. You don't have a place to live. You have two wives over there that you abandoned with two kids. And there are two um, warrants out for your arrest. You are none of these things. And if you can get the borderline to see that, it will mortify them. And then what happens is the, the, the narcissist wants nothing to do with you. They can't tolerate the thought of ever seeing you because you're their kryptonite. Now, having said that, that's what narcissistic mortification is. Having said that, uh, there are people out there teaching people how to do this. Like there are websites out there that will teach you, here's how you can destroy the narcissist. You mirror back to them, you mortify them. Don't do it. Do not do it. That doesn't fix the problem. For a couple of reasons. Number one, bear in mind that uh, borderlines and narcissists have nothing to lose. They don't have anything. Whatever relationship they have, whatever love they have, whatever success they have, whatever good feeling they have, whatever it is that they may have concocted in their life at the moment, is not real. They don't identify with it. They don't attach to it. The only thing that's real for them is the constant running from the kryptonite. That's the only real truth that they have. Their life is constantly about dissociating and running away from that. So if you mortify them, the thing that was keeping them alive, literally keeping them alive, is their false personality. It keeps them alive. It is a defense mechanism on steroids. If you take that away from a wounded animal, what do they do? They have nothing left to lose. They will come after you with everything they have. Maybe not. Maybe they'll run away. Maybe you're lucky enough, you know, they're a quiet borderline or something, they'll run away. But I wouldn't do it. 
I would not do it. Um, if, they're, if they're violent, if they've been violent to you once, if they've ever threatened violence, they may become violent. If they've ever threatened to harm your stuff or do anything to you, they may do that. So do not mortify them. That is my suggestion for you. Um, but the only thing that, and here's the other thing. A lot of people, you know, who go watch these, these videos about how to put the, the narcissist in their place. And here's the way that you can stop a narcissist in their tracks. All of those videos, the people who watch those videos are still attached. And they're, they, what's happened is they are either they are covert narcissists. And they've taken on the role of the, the codependent or they are codependents who have been infected with narcissism and they still want to keep the relationship going. And so they think, even though consciously they think, I'm gonna put that narcissist in, its, in his place. Mm -mm -mm. No, you didn't. Even though they think that's what they're gonna do, their motivation on an unconscious level is to gain power and to keep them and to get them. If you can't get them to love you, then maybe you can shame them into loving you. You become narcissist, become narcissistic. This is why I say, and this is just my opinion, my uneducated uh, opinion. I agree with Sam Vaknin. I agree that um, narcissists are failed borderlines. They're in the stage of trying to work through the disappointment of people not being perfect and they can't do it. So they, they act out their secondary psychopathic nature, which is they weren't able to keep up the firewall of I'm perfect. And so they vacillate back and forth. I would say that codependents are failed borderlines. They have just enough self uh, identity. They have just enough that they have uh, object constancy, they have time, they can make commitments and follow through. Uh, they can have an experience of love and being loved. They don't dissociate, although they, they do. At some point I'll talk about how codependents do dissociate. Um, but, um, Anyway, so you have enough borderline in you that when they put it into you, it, you become infected with it. And so you think you're going to get the narcissist or the borderline to stay because you're then going to mortify them. And that's going to put them in their place. But the problem is, in order for mortification to work, you have to have no attachment. You have to have no agenda. So the only true mortification of the narcissist has to be to mortify the narcissist in your own brain, in your own gut. And I became aware of this, that this is what happens. So when, you, when I talk about click the join button and do the three things I tell you to do, therapy. If you want to mortify the internal narcissist, I'm telling you exactly how to do it. Therapy. Twelve steps meditation if you do those three things those are the that is the kryptonite for the narcissist inside of you now if you start to do that if you're still in the relationship or you're still attached because even though they they broke up with you or you left them there's no closure they don't ever end relationships they take trophies they put you in their back pocket you never are gone from them. They never let go. There's never closure. That's part of what the, the ghosting is, the discarding. Discarding and ghosting is a way of keeping you because that is, that's the trump card. They're saying, you're, you're attached to me. I am so willing to do whatever it takes. I will destroy the thing I love most so that I can hold on to the power. So it's a power play. Because if there's any possible hint that if they let you love them, you might hurt them. They can't tolerate that thought. So once they fall in love, 
They must discard you so they can hold on to you. It's a way of holding on to you. Serial killers do this. You know, if you, if you study serial killers, you'll find a lot of them uh, are borderlines and narcissists. They, are, uh, they dissociate. And you will hear many of them say that, yes, all of my victims are still with me. They're my spirit wives now. That's what happens. They literally end your life, chop your head off. They discard you. But they're not, dis they're not ending the relationship. They're chopping your, your head off, literally or, and or symbolically. And they're putting it in their back pocket while they go looking for their next victim. So that's why, one of the reasons why you never stop thinking about them. So the other thing is, is that you, in order to mortify the narcissist, you have to have no agenda, which means you can't hate them. You can't be angry at them. You can't be looking for vengeance. You can't go supernova on them. You can't do any of that. Because all of that means that you're still attached. You're unconsciously wanting to gain power over them. You're trying to do their ver your version of, of discarding. Because you think by putting them in their place uh, 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 that somehow you won. But the only way that you get satisfaction out of that is if you don't understand they have a mental illness, they don't know what they're doing. You know, it's, uh, you know, how does that, how does, how do you gain any satisfaction from that unless you're projecting onto them that they still love you? That they ever loved you? Truly loved you? So, what happened with me, uh, as I'm looking back on it now that I'm understanding what narcissistic mortification is and all of that. Uh, by the way, this all came from me watching Sam Vakden, who said, if you mortify the narcissist, you'll become, uh, you know, he didn't use the word, but you'll become kryptonite to them and they won't want anything to do with you. Um, but what he didn't say in there, he's giving codependents far too much credit because he thinks that codependents can mortify a narcissist without any agenda and they can't you can't do it because if you go to i'm gonna now i'm, I'm gonna now face the narcissist on their own terms and i'm gonna show him what's what i'm gonna show him who he is and i've just decided i've had enough if there is the slightest bit inside of you that still wants an apology that wants an acknowledgement that wants love, if you want any of those things, they will know. You may piss them off, but it will only mean negative attention. It will only fuel their narcissistic rage and desire to win that war, and they will win. They will destroy you. You will not win that fight. The only way is if you have no agenda. And I'm here to tell you, you can't do that. When you first go no contact, when you block their phone, you block their email, you block their Facebook, you move, you get rid of your phone, you get a new one, you uh, put a, uh, whatever that is, a restraining order on them. Even when you're doing that, you are not done. That's just step one. Because if when you're doing that, you still have an attachment. How do I know that? Because it hurts like hell. It's the hardest thing you've ever done. You feel guilty and you feel afraid. You're worried, I, I may, this might have worked and I'm screwing it up. Maybe it was just about to work or they're going to get mad at me and they're going to slash my tires or maybe she'll come to my work or... You're not done. If you're thinking all those things, you're still attached. That has to happen. That's step one is to go no contact, even though you still have an agenda. Then you get your ass to therapy. You get your ass to, to a 12-step meeting. You work that inventory. You meditate on a daily basis. You're still not over them. You're not over them for weeks or months or maybe even years. I don't know. It takes a long time. And then slowly after you start to mortify them, 
The therapy and the 12 steps mortify the internal narcissist and you stop seeing them through your mommy colored glasses and you start to see them for who they really were. And then instead of rage or love or lust, instead of our anger, instead of all of those feelings comes this feeling of actual compassion and you see them for what they are. You mortify them. You see them as, oh my God, she was just a really damaged little girl. That's like, there's just, there's nobody there. Of course she did that. I would do that too. Oh my God, I thought that I loved her. I didn't love her. I thought she was my mom. She didn't love me. She thought I was her dad. Oh my God, there's no way it could have ever worked. She never could have loved me. It never could have worked. The best I got was that first two weeks of, of, uh, uh, of idealization. That's it. That was, that was as good as it would ever have gotten. And you don't say that with any sadness. You don't say that with disgust. You say that with awareness. And then there's no attachment. And then there's no need. And then all you have is honest hope that they find uh, some therapy and they can, they can work through it. Um, I never want to see them again because of what happened. But holy crap, I want nothing but the best for that person. And I'm so happy that I'm by myself and I'm so happy that I have friends and that I have a life now and that I've learned and I'm working through all of my childhood issues. I'm so happy that I am a self-contained individual. That's mortification. The only person that's going to be able to mortify the narcissist and the borderline is a therapist who has no agenda. You can't do it. It doesn't mean that people don't successfully mortify the, the borderline or the narcissist, but it's, I don't think that a, that a codependent can do it. I'll, I'll go even further because this is what happens in every uh, toxic relationship. So if you're the codependent, the borderline will take on the role of the narcissist. The borderline, by the way, is trying to get you to become the narcissist but you never will. And that's one of the reasons they hate you. They end up hating you because you never become a narcissist. You never, because you're a failed borderline and borderlines are failed narcissists, you aren't gonna be able to become a narcissist. You won't be able to do it. You might try, but it won't work. But what ends up happening with the borderline if they get together with an actual narcissist, which is what they're looking for. They're either looking for the codependent whom they can escape, whom they can cheat on, because actually what's happening with you, the codependent, the borderline is cheating on their internal narcissist, their mother, their father. They, that person in their head is telling them how worthless they are and that they must worship, you know, Jehovah, the God who, the jealous God. They cheat on Jehovah by being with you. They think when Jehovah's not looking, when angry God, monotheist God is not looking, they're going to find you. And they're going to have, and you'll save them. You'll be the Jesus who will die on the cross to save them from their sins, and they'll be forgiven. But it never works. Just like in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve had put on clothes because they felt naked, and Jehovah walks in, and he says, Why are you wearing clothes? What have you done? Did you eat of the forbidden fruit? Did you betray me? And that's what happens. One of the reasons the borderline must destroy you. So they either want that experience or they want to have the experience of being the codependent to Jehovah, which is the narcissist. So they want to worship Jehovah. So they're going to chase after a narcissist but what they're going to do to the narcissist, and this is why I, I've, I saw it happen, I heard about it, and this is why I say never try to mortify. Never try to mortify a borderline or a narcissist because they have nothing to lose. When the borderline gets together with a narcissist, what ends up happening is they take on the role of codependent, 
and then they become the perfect codependent, which is why they put up with so much abuse, abuse that they, you know, sexual abuse, all kinds of crazy abuse they wouldn't, they wouldn't put up with from you unless you actually were able to become a narcissist. But they put up with it from the from the uh, from the narcissist because what they're going to do is they're going to defeat the narcissist, and so they end up becoming the perfect um, codependent. They become the perfect um, object of abuse. They be they then the narcissist finds the perfect victim whom they can use as supply. And that makes the narcissist dependent on the borderline, who then now will take that and will dismantle the, the narcissist. My borderline ex explained it to me perfectly. She, she explained exactly how after the, you know, he put her through, you know, she explained all this, this mental abuse he was putting her through and controlling. And in that, she started asking questions. And then she started to mortify him. She mirrored him. And she was very proud of it. She said, and I said, when you say this, you're doing that. And then he said something else. And she said, when you say this, you're doing that. And she caught him because she knew him so well. And he was so attached to her that he fell apart that he completely fell apart and started uh, dissociating and started hallucinating and thought he was the, the devil and started seeing demons. And she said, and then I was able to leave. And I said, so you just destroyed him. The way you got out was you just destroyed him. That's, that's the game that's gonna happen. If you try to mortify a borderline or a narcissist, that is what will happen unless you have no attachment. And I guarantee you, Unless you've been in therapy and worked those steps and meditated and really honestly, truly look at them with compassion, that means without tearing up and feeling sorry for them and without feeling vengeful, unless you can do that, you are attached and you will lose. They will destroy you. So that's the thing to do. You have to mortify the internal narcissist, the internal borderline within you. And the only way to do that is by the three things that I said, therapy, 12 steps, and meditation. And of course, first step is going no contact. Uh, let's see, are there any questions here? I do like to take questions if you have any, but let's see. Um, but some borderlines are very humble. So Sarah Sarli, are you a borderline? On this channel, what we do is we acknowledge who we are. What is our attachment or our interest to the to the topic if you are a borderline and you're here to tell us that you're very humble i don't know what that means are you a uh, codependent and you're saying some borderlines are very humble um, either way what you're talking about is you're mistaking their and i don't know what what humility has to do with it the fact is is that borderlines and narcissists both suffer from tremendous like actual, actual, you know, um, uh, you, you know, fatal insecurity. So being humble isn't doesn't even enter into it. The the perfectionism and the uh, you know the quote ego of the narcissist is actually a false ego. It's not real. It's actually an overcompensation of extreme uh, um, insecurity. So the borderline also suffers from that same insecurity. So if you're mistaking insecurity for humility, that means nothing. Um, it's not, this isn't about being good or being righteous or being uh, moral. And to say they're humble is somehow making them different from the narcissist who's full of pride. It doesn't matter. It's the flip side of the same coin. So you haven't said who you are, what you are, why you're here, and what it is you want to say. Um, and why you want to make the differentiation understandable. I'm not judging it. It's a common misunderstanding, but that's, again, no, people aren't really seeing what borderline personality disorder really is. Because if you did that, you wouldn't make the distinction, as many people do. The difference between the narcissist and the borderline, there is no difference. 
There's just a slight difference in one is an overt narcissist and one is a secondary narcissist. One is a, was, one is a vulnerable narcissist, which could be mistaken as humility. And one is an overt narcissist, which can be mistaken as pride. Sim has a comment. After Discard, I had so much self-doubt, like you said about the music taste at the beginning, that it took me many friends in therapy to remind me the abuse. We auto-devaluate. Yeah, so that means that you're not done if that's still going on. So uh, people think I'm out of the relationship. I've been gone for four years, but then they'll talk about how I can't trust anybody. I can't be in a relationship. Uh, you know, I still think about them. It's still painful. And I wish that they will they ever realize what they've done. And, you know, this goes on for years. They're still attached. So the auto devaluation means when I auto devaluate, as you said, like when a, my, you know, I want to play my music and the flash goes through my mind. of That's stupid. You're stupid. You're old for listening to that. That's a part of me that still wants to reconnect and make it work. So um, you're not done. If you live there, it means that you're not done. And again, there is no closure with a borderline. They never, they never come to resolution. You will never get the freedom to move on from them. You know, this is why it's so important in normal relationships, divorces and things like that. You know, even though people, even if people split up and they don't talk to each other again, there is some kind of, of closure where each person is the relationship is acknowledged that it's over and that we're different and that we're moving on and there's this permission to move on and connect to somebody else you never get that with the borderline and the narcissist because they never got that they're still wrapped up waiting for their parents to love them so og1 kenobi Bro, I didn't know we were bros. Hey, bro. What's up, bro? Bro, I'm in a weird BPD relationship. She's 47 and I'm 36. It's fucking crazy. And what do you want from me? <laughs> um, so get out. Uh, are we going to talk about it? Are we going to sit there and talk about it? You know, it's like you're sitting there and there's, uh, you know, there's a bug that's that's you know, a giant, you know, bug and he's eating your arm and we're going to sit at the bar and you're going to talk about the bug that's eating your arm. And yeah, man, it's really messed up. Look at that bug. He's eating my arm. It's really painful. And I, you know, I don't know what, I don't know what you want from me. So what are you going to do about it? You want to stay in it or you want to leave? If you can't leave, that's something to talk about. There's, look, I'm telling you guys the truth. These cluster B relationships have the power to literally kill you. They have the power to create such turmoil within you that it could literally physically kill you. You could get some kind of crazy disease. I've seen it happen. So you know, I don't have any space to meet people there at the, yeah, I know what that's like, man, and just hang on, you'll be okay. I don't have any space in me for that. I, I accept that people are, when they're ready, they're either going to get, you know, help or they're not going to get help. They're going to do the work or they're not going to do the work. It's, uh, there's only one way. you got to get out and then you got to do the work to mortify the internal narcissist otherwise there's nothing to talk about it's all details at that point what else he says i would like to talk about it with you well that's what the link is all about go click on the link and if you want to want me to coach you and tell you how to find the help and to take action i'll be happy to do that um says neither i don't know what the neither is I'm free to move on. I just had to accept it that no matter what I could stay or go at any time. None of that, what you said, means anything. Because according to you, you're still in it. 
So you don't have any clue whether you can leave or not. You can tell yourself that all you want. It's true when you do it. When you leave and you go no contact, you throw your phone away, you get another phone, you, um, you block your email, you block your, all of your social media, you move, you go, to a, you go so that they can never ever contact you again. When you, you do it and there's no turning back, then I'll believe that you have the space to stay or go at any time. Until then, it's all talk. You hear me? There's, unless you do it, unless you do it, you haven't done it. So, uh, yeah, I don't see any more questions or comments or whatever. So anyway, there we go. So we're good, I guess, for the time being. So uh, stay healthy, stay well, everybody. And again, if you want the coaching, I don't even know if I'm doing that right. If you want the coaching, there it is. If you want the coaching, you can go to freedom.thunderwizard.com. And um, I'll do what I can to tell you what I know to help you find the direction you need to go to get what you want which is freedom. All right. Thanks, guys. Have a great afternoon, evening, morning, whatever it is where you are. And I will see you when I see you.